Well, I want to say welcome, and uh, nice to see everybody here over the lunch hour. It's really with great enthusiasm that we welcome today's guest speaker to Creighton University, because he's fashioned a career that I think is most appropriate for this series of events that Aaron has talked about, celebrating the role of water in our human experience. Dr. Robert Glennon is the Morris K. Udall Professor of Law and Public Policy in the Rogers College of Law at the University of Arizona. His recent book, Unquenchable, America's Water Crisis and What to Do About It, published in spring 2009, builds on his highly acclaimed previous book entitled Water Follies, Groundwater Pumping, and the Fate of America's Fresh Waters. He has a new publication uh, recently co-authored, uh, I think that's coming out uh, within this year, uh, entitled Solar Energy's Cloudy Future, something very relevant to some of our projects here at uh, Creighton University. The cogency of his ideas and writing has landed in spots as a speaker on national public radio, on John Stewart's Daily Show, and C-SPAN 2, in addition to his published pieces in various newspaper um, around the country. In his writing and commentary, Dr. Galanin addresses how we take water for granted and why the nation is in a water crisis. He uses very uh, useful case examples of cities, uh, Atlanta, Las Vegas, Buffalo, in the course of trying to, to make his case about this. He explores alternatives to enhancing the water supply and offers suggestions on what we can do to reclaim and conserve this finite resource. Dr. Glennon has a PhD in history from Brandeis University, a JD uh, from Boston College, and for those of you who are liberal arts students out here, a, a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from Boston College. He's been on the faculty at the University of Arizona College of Law since 1985, and before that was on the Wayne State University Law Faculty for eight years. Uh, Dr. Glennon has served as a visiting faculty member in Puerto Rico, in Japan, at the University of Minnesota, among other places. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Glennon. Uh, thank you very much. Is this microphone? The, the bell? Great, thanks. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation and the nice, uh, nice introduction. Uh, if you haven't seen Matt's piece at the, uh, the Fine Arts Center, you must. It's just a brilliant work of art. And uh, if you care about water, and if anything I say today resonates, you're going to find an amazing, an amazing, talented young artist who's sitting here in the second round. So, so engage him after the talk, and do get, get over there and take a peek at it. I've been asked to talk about the new book, uh, Unquenchable, came out last year. And I'd like to do this in three stages. First, I'd like to talk about the nature of the crisis. Because frankly, most Americans don't understand the truth of water crisis. I think you're different, you're here, you care about it. But still, I want to explore the dimensions. Because I think even those of you who follow water will be surprised at some of the parts of it. Second, I'd like to talk about what we can do about it. There are some real solutions, but there are also what I call surreal solutions to this water crisis. And then the third thing is I'd like to suggest three things that we should do in the United States, but we're not currently doing to keep the crisis from becoming a catastrophe. So first, I have to start with a quote from an Arizona writer, Ed Abbey, a curmudgeon of the first order, a real ordinary character. Plenty of water in the Mojave Desert unless you try to establish a city during the city. And what would that city be? That would be Las Vegas. So here's the Bellagio Fountain. For some people, it's the reason to go to Las Vegas. For others, it's the epitome of wretched excess. When Steve Wynn wanted to put this fountain in, he came up with $40 million to build it. It occupies a footprint of eight acres. It holds 27 gallons of water. And it has 1,200 heads to shoot the water as high as 250 feet into the desert sky, all to choreograph music. It's really quite an amazing thing. And yet, it's really only the beginning. How many of you know about City Center, which is being built as we, as we uh, sit here this morning? Uh, it's an MGM grand project. It's the largest privately financed construction project in American history. That's a bit of $9.1 billion. Quite astonishingly, it ranges to seven stories, seven towers. Range in size from 37 stories to 61 stories. Now to give you a sense of scale, 
off here on the left side of the screen, that little shadow, see that? That's the Monte Carlo Casino, which is one of the largest casinos on the Strip, and it looks like a tinker toy next to these, these, these towers that are being built. Yet something else is remarkable about City Center. There's only one casino. This is not about gaming. This is about Las Vegas having an unmatched capacity to reinvent itself again. People are buying condominiums in these towers from the states, from Canada, from the EU, from the Pacific Rim, not for gambling, but for the fine dining, for the retreats, for the shopping, for the clubs, for the entertainment, for the shows, all the other things that Las Vegas has. Now, there's only one problem. It's a big one. Las Vegas has run out of water. And the head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority understands this fully well. She's a little late coming to the game, fish a lot water, but now she's had a conversion. And like many religious converts, boy, she has come after this new faith with a real aggressiveness. And among other things that she is trying to do to get people to conserve, she's paying people to rip out water. Two dollars per square foot. And they have put their money where their mouths are. They've spent $150, $150 million, ripping out water. Second thing she's done, she's offered to build desalination plants on the Pacific coast of the cities of Tijuana <coughs> and San Diego. In turn, Las Vegas would take those cities, Colorado River water rights, out of Lake Mead and use them for the city of Las Vegas. Third thing she's done, she's embarking on a three billion, with a B, billion dollar pipeline to import water from groundwater aquifers 250 miles north of Las Vegas. Now these aquifers are located on the border of the state of Utah. And if you think about your history, who settled those areas? They were the original pioneers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And those people are not happy about Las Vegas coming out from the water. But from my perspective, as a guy who kind of gets a certain kick out of studying fights over water, a fight over water doesn't get any better than one that gets Mormons against Sin City. <laughs> There's one more thing that Las Vegas is doing, and that is they're running public service announcements on local television to try to persuade people not to waste water. And I'll show this video clip in a minute. Uh, we have a little problem with the tech, so let me just set up what's happening. There's a little old lady who's walking along, past the lawn, and the sprinklers are are watering the lawn, but also watering the sidewalk. So she goes up to the front door. Can I help you? Oh! <laughs> Schedule. Go to changeyourclock.com. Las Vegas has a different sense about what's appropriate for television and some other communities. Uh, not sure that the, the local public television station is going to be running a kick in the groin uh, advertisement anytime soon. Um, okay, but uh, let, let's be serious for a moment because, uh, sure, she's. The stunning thing about the Strip is they only use 3% of Las Vegas' water. 
and yet they are the economic driver in the state second to none. In Nevada, as in every western state, farmers are equal to water, between 70 and 80 percent. In Nevada, that supports the farming community of about 6,000 people. It's impressive. But it's also only the same number of jobs as a single casino presents. So when you start to look at the economic value of water, one of the things you realize is that the Strip is incredibly important economically to the entire state. Now, I start with Las Vegas because despite their naughty slogan about what happens there stays there, when it comes to water, that is the furthest from the truth. Because what we see in Las Vegas is now occurring elsewhere around the United States. So one of our wisest founding fathers, uh, Ben Franklin, we know the worth of water when the well goes dry. He was wrong. We Americans are sporting. We wake up in the morning, we turn on the water, and out comes as much water as we want for less than we pay for cell phone service or for cable television. When most Americans think of water, they think of it as though it were the air, infinite and inexhaustible. But for all practical purposes, it's very finite and very exhausting. The nature of the crisis. Just since 2007, Colorado farmers watched helplessly as their crops withered in the field. The state engineer told the groundwater pumpers to turn off their well in order to protect the rights of senior prior appropriate. The little hamlet of Orm, Tennessee, literally ran out of water and had to truck it in. Scripps Institution scientists predict that Lake Mead, the principal water supply for Las Vegas, has a 30% chance of going dry by the year 2050. In South Carolina, one of the most humid parts of the country, a paper company in Bow Water had to close its doors, fire hundreds of workers because low flows in the river prevented the company from discharging its wastewater. Nearby in Georgia, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission denied permits for two new power plants not enough water to run. Elsewhere in California, the Central Valley, well, they've had some recent rains, but the drought continues. And those economic losses already exceed a billion dollars, and there is no end in sight. The largest of the Great Lakes, too low to float fully loaded cargo ships, requiring offloading of hundreds of tons of freight and dramatically increasing the price of shipping. Off the coast of California and Oregon, commercial fishing season cancer. Again, going into the third year, idling hundreds of fishing boats in decimating fishing communities up and down the coast. Three other western states, including my own, denied permits for coal-fired power plants. Scores of residential and commercial projects in Southern California canceled, and Atlanta, Georgia came within 90 days of having its principal water supply, Lake Mead. Why not? Now, what's stunning about this litany is it's not the usual recitation of environmental degradation. It's not about low flows, it's not about temperature spikes, about salinity levels, about groundwater the cable declines, threatened or endangered species, no, no. This is about the health of the American economy. And we may threaten the United States about running out of oil. But water lubricates the American economy just as oil does. 